Welcome to Corpse Club, the official podcast of DailyDead.com. I'm one of your co-hosts, Jonathan James. I'm joined today by Derek Anderson, Scott Trebbett, and our new addition to the Corpse Club cast, Brian Christopher. Today, we're going to kick off our next installment of the 2010s, 2000 teens. I don't think we settled on what we want to call it. I don't know if history has, um, but we're doing a retrospective series. It was Derek's idea to, uh, as we work our way to the end of the 20 teens, we're going to take a look back at each year, um, see how our favorite movies from back then stacked up, what was memorable in that year, and uh, and yeah, travel back in time a little bit. Um, so, you know, if you were here for uh, the the last episode when we discussed it, we didn't just talk movies. We talked uh, special or uh, pop culture events. We talked video games. We talked TV. So we're going to do a little bit of that um, so I can kind of jog everybody's memory. And if we look back at, uh, at 2011, some of the standout pop culture moments, one of the first ones when I was searching for it was Oprah's final episode. That was that was one of, that was one of, was one of the big things. It's a real exciting oh, 2011, right? Forget? I know. 25, 25 years. That was her final episode. Uh, the final Harry Potter movie, not counting Mysterious Beasts, came out in the summer. Uh, the Royal Wedding happened. I didn't know when it happened, but it, uh, it, it's 2011 <laughs> to my surprise. Uh, and then I also found that, that, that words like OMG and LOL were added to the Oxford Dictionary and now are officially words. Um, so, uh, so wow. yeah, big, big year. <laughs> uh, the, the band REM announced that they were breaking up after 31 years. I really liked REM. I'm sad Crazy. they're gone. <laughs> the Kindle <laughs> Fire was released. So Amazon was, was, was dipping their toes into tablets. Which and one was the Fire? That, that was that a, was it like a, an ebook or was it like a, a yeah, it was their first was tablet it? where you could, you could okay. it was an ebook and you could also watch movies and basically access Amazon Prime Video before it was really good. Now it's an awesome horror platform. And mm -hmm. the, the 2011 fad was planking. Did anyone, did any one of you plank? House. Did anybody plank? <laughs> Derek, did, you were young enough. Did not, you and your friends weren't planking in 2011? No, no, we were not. No, I we mean, did it. we were rebels. We were doing the opposite. We were non-planking. We were sitting in chairs watching okay. TV. <laughs> Brian, no planking. Um, I'm actually trying to remember exactly what planking was. So planking <laughs> is kind of where you just like, you like... Basically, you're, you're like flat as a board on on an object. So like you might just do it like on the top of like a cabinet or a desk. And the point was to kind of like plank on a weird spot and see where you could balance. I don't know if I planked. Maybe I planked. Uh, it I sounds planked like something all over the place. Yeah, it's, it sounds like something I did. I wish Tamika was here because I feel like Tamika planked. She uh, fortunately she wasn't feeling good and lost her voice. Uh, we'll have her back for our next retro. She was there for the first one. But I feel like Tamika. Tamika, hopefully you are planking. None of us were cool enough to to really be into that. The um, underground world of planking. I know, right? Fast the, and Furious presents. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the cost of a gallon of gas was three fifty two. I think it's lower now. I actually think it's lower. And uh, the cost of a movie ticket was eight twenty. That was the average cost of a movie ticket. Wow. I don't know what it is now, but I know I pay. <laughs> it's almost I pay, double. Yeah, I pay 12 for a regular movie. And if you go see it on IMAX or the RPX for Regal, it's like 18 bucks. So like, Ours yeah, they, is 14 wow. regular. Yeah. There's a fan, like the Fandango fee is more than eight fifty nowadays. Oh, that, that's true. Oh, yeah, yeah. The convenience you, fee. But but you need to do it if you're if you want to reserve a seat these days. Like I have mm -hmm. to, I don't I don't I, I don't want to drive. It's, it's sometimes it's twenty or depending on the theater, it might be forty minutes for me to go. So I can still get a ticket for like five thirty two on Tuesdays. Is this a true it, story? It is. It, it's a theater that hasn't <laughs> converted to the reclining seats, but they're going Sound. to. <laughs> so I'm going to milk that for all it's worth until they put in the new seats. And then it'll be like a $12 base fee. I'm sure. Crazy. Derek, before they do that, make sure you plank on one of the old seats. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hashtag it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and interestingly enough, we were talking in our last episode about how this year is such a great year for horror movies, especially during the summer. Um, but, you know, really, the, the, the 20 teens is packed with horror, especially when you look at, you know, the the indie releases like we've we've had pretty good years. Um, so I'm going to run down a list of some of the, the uh, highlights or some of the, the movies I have, at least on my list. And then we're going to take some time, talk about them, talk about some things that might not be on this list. Um, but some of the releases include Red State. Tucker and Dale versus Evil, 
Apollo 18, if anyone remembers that. John Carpenter is The Ward, the remake of The Thing, The Right, Stakeland, Absentia, uh, Mick Garris' is a Bag of Bones, I do remember that one, Chillerama, Don't Be Afraid of the Dark, Dylan Dog, Drive Angry, Hostel, Part 3, Paranormal Activity 3, Shark Knight 3D, and Quarantine 2 Terminal. And of course, there are other movies. Um, So kind of like what we did last time, I want to call out some of those and we'll move on to TV. We'll move on to uh, video games. Uh, Scott, let's start with you. What do you think was a a standout movie or a movie from 2011 that you want to talk about? Uh, well, one that you didn't mention was uh, Final Destination 5, um, which so far has been the last one in the series and a fitting end, I thought, especially after the rather disappointing uh, number four, the racetrack uh, one, which which wasn't good at all. Final Destination 5, I think, is really great because it has... Um, some of the creativity that the franchise was starting to lose. Uh, it's got some of the best kills in the whole series. It has very appealing characters. It has, a uh, um, party rental, Tom Cruise. Um, what else it's just, and the way that the movie finishes, um, and we are doing spoilers, Derek, so you're free to, to chat. Spoil away. Um, <laughs> spoil <laughs> away. The way that it 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 brings it back around to the first movie is just brilliant. It's something you don't see coming until the final moments. And it's just hilarious. And it's a true celebration of the whole series. And um, if they don't make another one, I am more than happy with uh, with that series. It, if it ends there, that's a high note. And but think, as we know, yeah, they will go, be Derek. doing another one. They are. It's because coming back. They, they knew that Scott, even though he says he doesn't want another one, really does deep down. Oh, of course I do. <laughs> it's it's interesting culturally how much Final Destination comes up with, with people that have seen it. Like, I can't tell you how many times, and I don't watch those movies very regularly, but they're like that concept is kind of like burned in my head. And any time, you know, we're driving and there's a, a truck that has, you know, logs or anything that can fall off of it, I'm like, oh, it's a Final Destination moment. Or any time yep. something falls, it's weird. Or I think like there's a chance of me dying. I'm like, oh, this is like, this is Final Destination. Like, just watch. I'm going to like trip down the stairs and then I'm going to think I'm going to be okay. And then like something's going to fall from the ceiling and crush my head. Um, and it happens regularly. I don't know if it's just me. Do, do you guys do this or am I crazy? Uh, I 100% do that. And this is actually even coming from someone who I don't think I've seen a full Final Destination movie since the second one. Uh, For whatever reason, I just kind of trailed off on them. But uh, uh, part of that is because I feel like you can just watch the best parts on YouTube and just watch through some of the kills. Um, But, yeah, it's definitely one of those things where, like, if you happen to see, like, a nail standing up the wrong way, it's like, well, that's bound to be some kind of Rube Goldbergian uh, mm-hmm. starter to my death. <laughs> yeah, we were just talking about the new Child's Play movie, and I'll try not to go too deep into spoilers with that. But uh, <laughs> uh, we were talking about the snowblower uh, kill with the Christmas lights and how even that seemed like it was Final Destination-esque in its setup. And I think it's got such an imprint on pop culture, not just on the horror genre, but just in pop culture in general, uh, a little less now just because we haven't had a movie since 2011 and the current like younger generation hasn't had one to go see in theaters for a while. But I think it's like you said, Scott, this is like the bow on the original five movies. And I agree. It is that perfect ending the way it does go full circle. And yeah, I think it's it is one of the most shocking uh, things I, that probably came out in 2011 that people didn't expect. Uh, just the the way it ends and and kind of brings things around. But uh, yeah, I think it's it's really fitting that you brought it up because now we are going to probably see a, a reboot. I'm guessing. I know Marcus Dunstan and Patrick Melton are working on a screenplay for a new one, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what they do with that. But I think. Like you said, it was nice that even though we haven't had one in years, it's it's good that this was the last one because, you know, four had some issues and, uh, you know, five was kind of a way to wrap it up on a nice note uh, for a number of years. 
Yeah, I mean, and I'm okay with actually with with a franchise doing what Final Destination did and take a little time off. Like, if you end on a high note, like, there's nothing wrong with sticking your landing on a franchise and saying, we're good for a little bit um, before it gets to the point of too tired and then bring it back 10 years later or something like that or close to it. Um, yeah, I, I actually think that that's probably a better way to go and let let fans really love it, let them look fondly on the past installments, and then hopefully, you know, build up some excitement over a few years. Funny you yeah, should I'm, say stick the landing with the gymnast right? stuff. Oh, yeah, that, that, that pun that's wasn't funny. even intended. <laughs> no, look at that. But yeah, it'll be 10 years before the next installment comes out, you know. I would think that's so, yeah. crazy yeah. to think, but holy crap. Wow. I know. Time flies. So this is what it feels like to see the years go by. You know what? The, the funny oh, thing is, up, though, Derek. we <laughs> we have this retro to say that having to listen to him, <laughs> twelve years old. <laughs> you don't know old, sir. I, I don't even funny. know old. Yeah, you know, with, with with a group where Scott's here. So, oh, hey, 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 hey what Bye. the hell? Yeah, look at this. Wow. <laughs> Former Man, bonus heavy. commentary buddies <laughs> turned. <laughs> That's, well, he canceled on me this month, so I'm, I'm a little mad at him. No, yeah, I heard about that. Um, so let's uh, let, let's move on. We're, we're, we're done with the final destination for now, and uh, let's go to Brian. Brian, what's uh, what, what's your pick for 2011? What do you want to talk about? I would like to talk about a remake, uh, the obviously 2011 uh, version of Fright Night. Uh, directed by Craig Gillespie and starring a whole bunch of people that I really like. Uh, the late Ian, Anton Yelchin, Colin Farrell, Christopher mintz Plassey, David Tennant, Morgan Poots, and of course, Tony Collette. Um, so the first thing I need to confess is I actually saw this movie before I saw the original Fright Night. So I wasn't comparing it to the original when I saw it. So for me, it's just a lot of fun. Um, Honestly, starting with uh, Colin Farrell playing a grade A douchebag and just having a lot of fun doing it. Um, uh, Anton Yelchin's good in anything he's in. Uh, I, I really, you know, I think we're going to miss him as a, a genre community just because he was putting out some really great stuff. And it's just a shame that we won't get to see kind of what uh, what he would have grown into over the years. Um and uh, I also uh, I loved Mick Lovin in it as Evil Ed. I thought Christopher Mintz Plassey was really good. He brought something different to it. Um, uh, I've since gone back and seen the original Fright Night, and uh, what the the original actor did for Evil Dead I thought was very different. Um, I felt like uh, Christopher Mintz Plassey was a little bit more um, sympathetic because maybe he just wasn't quite as annoying as Evil Dead or the original Evil Ed was. Uh, so um, yeah, I, I just really enjoy this movie. This is one for me that I haven't seen since the theater, but I remember going to see it and I, I enjoyed it. It's interesting because I, I like looking back at these movies to be like, like, oh, that was good. Like, I would rewatch that. And then sometimes it just doesn't happen because we have so many great movies coming out these days. Um, but this is definitely one, one that I had fun with. I, I, if I remember correctly, um, leaving the theater, I was real happy with David Tennant, but, but I loved him from Doctor Who. Um, but I think that the movie worked best when it strayed from the source material, when it tried to pull things in that were too close to the original Fright Night, I think is when maybe it didn't work. And when it started going in its own direction, uh, that's kind of when I really liked it. This actually goes back to what we were talking about with Child's Play, where yeah. what I like about the Child's Play remake is that it completely separated itself. Obviously, there are some similarities, but they went a vastly different direction. And I think that, that the, the, the fact that even they did it a little bit here, or uh, more than most movies, I think is what made Fright Night successful and fun. Yeah, I really like, like you mentioned, when it does do something different, I like how it's in Nevada and it has the neighborhood in the middle of the desert. It's very much, it's even more isolated. So I guess it's taken it out of the suburbia a little bit, even though it is technically a suburban community, I suppose. But I really like that atmosphere to it and the fact that they made uh David Tennant's character, uh, Peter Vincent, like a, the magician this time around. It it felt like a very Vegas movie, which I think was really interesting, gave it some more personality for it to stand on its own. And like you said, Brian, I think Colin Farrell kind of steals the show. He's really perfect for that role. And I, it was really just refreshing to see them go in that direction. And it felt like the Sarandon character enough where I think people – 
that were familiar with that franchise were you were able to please both camps, people that were new to it and people that liked the original movie. And it story wise, it does for me, it goes a little all over the place, but I do like it. I definitely like it more than I don't. And I, I remember enjoying it overall. And I, I remember like foster the people was in it with the pumped up kick song, which was really big at the time. And, uh, I, I like you said, I like Christopher as evil Ed a lot. I, I really enjoy evil Ed in the original movie, uh, with Stephen Jeffries, but I, I know what you mean when you say he can get on your nerves because that character is so, uh, good at uh, getting on Charlie Brewster's nerves, but uh, it was interesting. I think Christopher was perfect for casting that role, and I'm glad that they kind of tried to do the same skeleton of the movie and then go in little different directions here and there. I, I think there was a lot of digital, but I think there was definitely some practical too with the effects work, but uh, it was pretty fun. I just remember having a good time with it. So uh, like Jonathan said, though, I don't think I've watched this since theaters, so I should revisit this one. <laughs> I haven't seen it since it, it first came out either, but uh, I honestly, I can't really remember anything about it. And that's not necessarily an indictment against the movie. I just, other than the cast, I remember the cast specifically, but I don't just remember too much about the movie. And that could be because I thought perhaps it, it stayed too close to the original and nothing was popping out of me particularly, but I, I did think that Colin Farrell was really good and, and the entire cast was good, but there was nothing different enough uh, for me, I guess, for the movie that is sticking in my in my head. So I, I would give it another shot. I've only seen it the one time. Like I said, I, I it's just not sticking with me, but uh, I would give it another shot. And uh, looping back around to something Derek mentioned about how, um, you know, the Stephen Jeffrey version of Evil Ed was kind of a lot more obnoxious and annoying. Um, I I do think that was definitely a deliberate choice in terms of the movie. And one of the interesting ways that uh, the remake diverged in that in the original, the relationship is kind of tense because Evil Ed's kind of that guy where it's like, why am I your friend? Why was I ever your friend? You are so damn annoying. Um, <laughs> whereas in the remake, it's more of a, like, it's just this sense that Charlie feels like he's evolved past evil. Mm. Ed. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's something that is very relatable. That idea that, you know, sometimes friendships end not because of any one reason, but people just kind of grow apart um, and, and it kind of makes it a little extra sad uh, just because it's not something that, you know, both both characters are still people that are likable. And, um, you know, the, the fact that they drift apart isn't necessarily anyone's any one person's fault, but it just kind of makes it a little extra uh, adds that extra layer of kind of uh, sadness to it. Yeah, like when they're watching the video of, I think they were dressed up as, I don't know if it was Renaissance characters or like they were sword fighting and stuff like that. It felt like, yeah, they were looking at a relationship that was, had kind of, like you said, he feels like he's almost got to leave him behind. I, I totally agree with that. Sad. <laughs> so, Derek, I need a what's, tissue. Uh, <laughs> jumping off this sad note, I want to hear what... Uh, what you got to, uh, I, I know what you're going to pick. So I want to hear you talk about it. <laughs> Actually, I just have the sorting hat here. I'm just going to put my hand and grab a random. Yeah, note. nice try. I'm going to mix it up here. Uh, for my first pick, uh, I'm going to begin just by saying that Heather Wixon has been a champion of this movie for years. And if Anybody deserves credit for this movie being, you know, relevant right now and being a part of the horror discussion. I think Heather deserves a lot of credit for that. And uh, she's kind of gotten me reinvested in this movie just because she's always championing it on Twitter. And that movie is Scream 4. So I believe if if she was on this episode, I think she definitely would have this movie. Um, I'll try to do my best to uh, live up to that level and talking about it. But uh, I just remember... For me, this was by far like the most anticipated movie, horror movie for me to go see in 2011. I remember sitting in the theater uh, with my friend Zach and we'd always go see movies every week. But this movie, just waiting to watch it, I was like 
literally shaking. I was so just amped up and I just so rarely get that re- like pregame reaction to a movie. And I just, I got really into the screen movies. Like once again, uh, before seeing the fourth one, I rewatched them. I was cover on all the horror news sites. This is before I was writing for a horror site. I was like on all the horror sites looking up any information or rumor or hint of a rumor for the movie. I remember desperately kind of wishing that Jamie Kennedy would pop up as Randy Meeks uh, because his death in Scream 2, I still haven't gotten over. But at the same time, I feel like that death needs for that death to be meaningful. It's, it needs to stay the way it is. So I ultimately respected them for not bringing him back. Um, maybe if he had like another video that he had recorded or something, that would have been fun. But uh, the movie itself, though, I, I think it it deserves a rewatch. Um, if, if anyone kind of wrote it off that first time they watched it, it really kind of was ahead of its time in a way, uh, I think because of the technology aspect and the way they keep referencing horror remakes and what was going on in the genre at the time. And we were still in a lot of the horror remake territory that we've we're still in that territory to some extent, but back then it was like, that was the main bread and butter. It seemed like, and I I thought that Kevin Williamson's screenplay really dug into that in a relatable way. And I loved like the fake out begin beginning of the movie where it's like a movie within a movie. I thought it was just really a clever way to kind of bring you back into the franchise all those years later. It's not my favorite scream movie, but I think it definitely holds up. Uh, you know, here we are, almost a decade later and it's it still has something to say about uh you know fame and you know the emma roberts character who's emma roberts is so good in this movie it, the throwing herself through the glass table and stabbing the boyfriend and the groin or shooting the boyfriend and the groin and and every like that performance i think just makes it worth it alone to watch the movie again because she her career's kind of blown up since this came out and i think it all maybe started here uh, but it was uh it was always fun just to see that original trilogy come back of david uh, neve and courtney and i i feel like we kind of got a little, you know, cheated as horror fans that we didn't get a scream five or six, because I feel like this was a really could have been a really interesting, uh, first film and like a new trilogy. And I think maybe that's the problem is that you have scream one, two, and three. And I enjoy all those. I know some people have screams that they don't like, uh, with me, I like, there's not a scream in the franchise that I don't like, but it's like, you have those first three screen movies and then you have the fourth one kind of on the outside and it's not really a part of its own trilogy it's kind of like this continuation and it feels almost like it always gets left out for that reason but there's just a lot of uh, cool things in there for people to see it's it's probably arguably the funniest movie in the of all the screen films just because it maybe is a little more lighthearted and it it has a little more dark comedy edge to it and I think it does kind of it carries on that Randy Meeks spirit, that kind of smart ass spirit a little bit. Uh, so I, it was it was fun. I think we could have seen a little more with the original Woodsboro three that, you know, survived the original trilogy. But I think the young cast is so good that I really don't mind, um, even though sometimes it feels like they are taking time away from these other characters that I really love. But uh, obviously, Wes Craven, you know, this was a great opportunity for him to come back to this franchise and kind of show that he was still a master at the craft. So I think if, you know, even though we didn't get a scream five, it was totally worth it just that we got to see Craven come and do his thing and, and show that he still had it. And yeah, I just, uh, it's, it's definitely worth that rewatch. And I think it holds up. It just kind of makes me wondering what could have been in a scream five, but, uh, if scream four is the last one, then, you know, that's uh, worth it on its own. Well, what I what I like about Scream 4 is, you know, Scream 3 was so big and bloated and and it had an an air of like money being thrown behind it. And it, Scream 4 gets back to the basics, I think, uh, more in the spirit of the original one that was, yes, well made. Yes. You know a little bit slick, but still there was a bit of an, an, an edge to it. And especially coming as it did after three, which was really kind of toothless. And like I said, bloated, uh, four has a bit more of an edge to it and it's leaner and it's meaner. 
And uh, I think <laughs> as it did come after three, I think it, it 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 moves itself up the rank quite a bit just by that virtue alone. But it's uh, it's good. It's a good return to form, I thought, for the series. And like you said, Derek, if if that's the last one that we get, then then I think they went out uh, pretty strong. For me, this is one that, that I actually I was I was looking as, as Derek was was talking about it. I looked at my review and I, I was was uh, skimming through it. I give it a, a two point five out of five, and I actually looked and, and my review is more positive than, than that score. So um, I, I probably should have revised it. My score is a lot a lot a uh, lot rougher back when it's we never first too started. Late. I, yeah, <laughs> well, you know what? Actually, I talked about doing like a a, rev- a review remix. I never had time to get to it, but I was like r- reading all my old reviews and being like do i still agree with this and then and then writing a second review on it um, i'm sure somebody else has done it but i always had the the uh, interest in getting to that but um anyway long story short i liked it quite a bit when it came out um, i think that i felt like it should have leaned more into emma roberts towards the end and just you know and just gone for the kill and um if I'm not mistaken, that was the the plan, or that was the the in, in the concept stages, and what we see is some meddling to make sure that the, the core cast could all kind of come back and stay intact. Um, and, and I kind of wish it was more of a full passing of the torch. Um, I think they set up some really great characters in this one, and I think they kind of had it ready to become a new trilogy of films, and um, and then they just they they played it a little safer at the end. Um, that being said, I liked it a lot better than three. Um, I, I really enjoy the franchise as a whole. I, I, I've enjoyed the uh, first two seasons of the, the TV series. So, um, yeah, this was a good one for me. And there's there's really only one thing that I can say about Scream 4, and that's that I have not seen it. <laughs> uh, um, you're going to have um, to you're going to have to rectify that. I really, really do. Um, if for nothing else than to make sure that uh, Heather doesn't hunt me down and uh, stab me. Um, <laughs> She's the next ghost face. <laughs> and it's, it's one of those things that's been sitting. It's on Netflix. It's been sitting on my Netflix queue for like as long as it's been on Netflix. And for whatever reason, I just haven't gotten to it. Um, I like it sounds like something I would really, really enjoy. Everything I've heard about it sounds great for, for whatever reason. It's just still in that little blind spot area of mine. We all have them. It's it's it, we should actually one day we should just do an episode or, or maybe it would be terrible because people would listen to us and they'd be like, we never want to listen to you guys again. How have you not seen this and this and this? But the fact is that everybody has blind spots. Some of them are very surprising. And um, yeah, so that's there. There's no shame. Um, that's what I'm trying to say. New episode theme, blind spot horror. Yeah. <laughs> and then we each, uh, <laughs> it'll be our top hundred movies. We haven't seen three hours. Of. We haven't seen this, but we'd like to get to it one day. It's, it's on my Netflix queue. It's in, it's in my Amazon, uh, watch list or to watch list, or it's, it's in, it's a Blu-ray that hasn't been opened yet. That's the worst one. <laughs> <laughs> you can just you guys, literally read, read the plot summary off of Wikipedia yeah. for every movie. <laughs> You That's guys, true. you guys ever hear of this one called uh, Jaws? What's that? I hear it's. I'm hearing things. <laughs> I only saw that for the first time about three years ago. That's right. <laughs> Better but late it was than in never. the movie theater. But have you summer, seen? So. Oh, okay. Well, it was, it was worth the wait then. If you can see it like that. Yeah, no yeah. kidding. Now and Jaws no, two though. Have you seen Jaws, Jaws two? I saw in the theater. Oh, nice. Yeah, when I was eight years old. Yeah, it holds up. I just rewatched it. It's not scary. It wasn't scary when I was eight, and so it's <laughs> definitely not scary now. Take but didn't say it was scary. Too. I just said it was a fun, fun movie. <laughs> well, it's got Donna Wilkes. In. Anything with Donna Wilkes, I'm there. So welcome to our Jazz Two episode, folks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next time. Okay, so uh, anyway, it's my turn to pick. I was going to pick this last episode when we were doing our 2010s, and then thankfully Derek saved me before we got to the episode and was like, hey, Insidious didn't really come out in 2011. and uh, 2010. 
or 2010. Yeah. And some of you Googlers may uh, see helping me again. Thank you, Derek. And some of you Googlers <laughs> may be like, hey, well, I go on Google, I type in 2010 horror movies and it says Insidious or I go to IMDb. And that is because very few people did get to see it in 2010. If you were at TIFF, it premiered there um, in Toronto in September. And uh, that's that's when it got picked up. Um, but, you know, it, most people didn't get to see it. When we talk about our release dates and like pop culture events, when most horror fans got to check something out, we're talking about the wide theatrical release, which was in 2011, I believe, April 1st, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Insidious for me is like one of the one of my favorite horror movies of the last 10 years. Um, for me, this is, you know, this was really kind of James Wan leaning into his love of classic horror. Um, we saw with obviously we saw it was kind of a very modern modernly filmed and stylized movie he did very well with that um with dead silence i think he was trying to maybe mix the two maybe a little and push it a little more in the saw direction plus the classical and he didn't have that that balance uh there and even though i love the movie it just didn't take off and i also know that they were were hobbled by um by universal it was like you can't do this you can't do that and so they really wanted to push the hard R and they, they couldn't do it. Um, and so I think that made him kind of rethink his approach and which is the studios aren't going to let me, uh, I'm not gonna be able to, to get people into, into seats or show a movie on a wide release. If I go too far with it, I want to really go with these classical elements. And he created this, you, you know, we were talking about ratings in the other episode as well. And, and Insidious is PG-13. And he did a great job of being able to make this like really frightening movie, um, but also make it so that it was it was accessible to everyone so that you could take your family to it or teens could go and, and check it out. And, um, and, and you know, it's such a great cast, too. I mean, Patrick Wilson, who we all know is, is fantastic now, but I hadn't really paid too much attention to him uh, previously. I can't remember if Watchmen was before that, but I think that's the only other thing I remember him for from at the time. And, um, you know, and, and this movie is uh, is one that I rewatch, rewatch constantly. Um, it, it's I actually think that it's one of those movies that I didn't need sequels for. I'm very happy with uh, with Insidious uh, two and three, or excuse me, three and four, um, where they kind of you know focus on Lin Shay and they go back to the past. But I really love the the ending of Insidious that it ends on this more ambiguous but likely downer of an ending, and I don't want the explanation. <laughs> um, but yeah, this mm. was this was a great movie. Uh, like I said, this is a great movie, and this this kicked off like we didn't know like now we know what james wan's capable of but we didn't really know what he was capable of uh, in my opinion uh when it comes to this classic horror until he did insidious isn't it amazing that insidious is pg-13 and annabelle comes home is r because think of how intense that's those scares are in in insidious and it's kind of got that haunted house vibe to it too and i'm just thinking how did that way happen? scarier way <laughs> way scarier and the ending alone you would think that would earn it an r rating But you really hit on something there, Jonathan, because this was the movie after Dead Silence. You know, this was the movie. This this movie is the is the template for the whole Conjuring um, series and, and the way that they're made. Certainly the ones where he's really hands on and it, it really having Patrick Wilson. Um, I was the same way. I think Watchmen was the only, well, and hard candy, hard candy mm. and Watchmen were the only two things I think I had really seen him in or, or noticed him in. Um, but they're very, you know, character based, uh, character based horror. And like you said, classical horror, you use a lot of, you know, elements from from Hammer and Amicus. And it's really an old fashioned movie in so many ways. Um, And he manages to just tweak the formula enough with some unique, um, creepy themes and and phrases like having the tiny Tim song, you know, the tiptoe through the tulips. Oh, yeah. uh, Playing. That's brilliantly done. And uh, and it has one of the best uh, genuine jump scares of the past 10 years or maybe even beyond with the the demon behind 
behind uh, Patrick Wilson sitting at the table, oh. which was, which is like next level fantastic. So, yeah, I think it was the movie that really set up the kind of, of, of haunted house movies that he wanted to do. It's really, I think the template for the conjuring uh, movies and certainly one of the best. I like this one and I like two. Uh, I like this one and two quite a bit. And then they kind of lost me with, uh, with three and four. But having said that, I think the first two are, are fantastic. Yeah. I think oh, you go ahead, Derek. I just, yeah. Like you guys said, I think this is the one that gave James Wan the, confidence and also the marketability to be able to go in and make the conjuring cinematic universe because like like you said scott it was dead silence and uh death sentence which is still my personal favorite james wan movie but you know death sentence for sure was made on a lower budget and not as many people seem to see those movies or gravitate towards them in theaters so when insidious comes out and makes such an impression and people go and see it and people are freaked out by it. I think it, it kind of opens that door for the conjuring later on and kind of reestablishes James Wan as the real deal in 2010s horror, because I think everyone knew him as like the saw guy at that point, but he had only done the first saw movie and the saw franchise had already gone on to become like the annual horror event. But because he had only done that first one, maybe people were thinking, well, you know, how can how you know what else is going to do to scare us is he a true like horror master and i think insidious is the really big step that a lot of people were waiting for and it certainly influenced i think a lot of what came the rest of the decade and what's still happening now um, even though it's not in that conjuring universe it has so much of the conjuring personality and it establishes that relationship with james wan and patrick wilson which of course will lead to him playing ed warren uh, so i think it's got to be one of the most influential movies of 2011 if not the most influential so it occurs to me that when i went to Jonathan and said, hey, I'd really like to be part of this 2011 uh, retrospective uh, that maybe I should have made sure I saw like any of the major movies from this year. Because I'm <laughs> really, oh, my God. I am really looking like a just jackass. roll with it. Just, just make it up. Just roll with it. <laughs> just read that like, Wikipedia. Yeah, that, that insidious movie. <laughs> Man, it was a good one. Um, James Wan. Yeah. Yeah. Contra <laughs> Universe. Great, great stuff. I've, I've definitely seen. Any of the Conjuring movies? Uh, it's it's, um, it's all good. There's, there's 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 no shame. I'm I'm crying here. A few tears for you, but and, and this one is just personal preference. I'm not normally that into haunted house movies. I think the only one that comes to mind that I'm really into is um, Burnt Offerings, and mm. I, I will say that just to you know. Kind of warm <laughs> myself back up to Scott after that one person joke. <laughs> uh, but I swear to God, I've seen 2011 movies. I just haven't seen any of the ones we've talked about except for the one I picked. But that's okay because <laughs> we're, we're bringing them back so that you and, and our listeners can, can check them out and be like, hey, I haven't seen Insidious either. That's well, right. Check it out if you like the Conjuring movies. Um, you know, something else I want to talk about as well is, uh, is Lee Winnell. He's the writer. Right. I think that this is... Uh, a fantastic story, which I'll get back to in a minute, but I think he did a great job at, at writing characters and including funny moments. I think having uh, Tucker and Specs, I think um, bringing, you know, uh, Lorraine Lambert, uh, who was played by Barbara Hershey. I think that um, on top of, you know, the great cast, I think it, they had great material to work with. And uh, I, I think that that, uh, you know, the the James Wan, Lee Winnell, that partnership uh, was, was probably the strongest here. Um, and what I, what I really love about this story to me is I, I, again, and we didn't talk about this when we were talking about our, uh, our conjuring universe list because this doesn't count, but I mean, this would be on the top for me. Like I, I prefer insidious to all the conjuring universe movies, but what I love <gasps> about this, no, by, by far. And I, I really Jonathan. like the conjuring too, but I love insidious. <laughs> um, yeah. And I don't even, that's I don't hot, even save it for the hot takes. I don't even know if that's a hot take to be honest. <laughs> um, but, uh, 
but yeah, I'll, I'll die on that hill. But no, I think that the greatest thing about this is, I mean, I think the idea is kind of, is terrifying that you can have this this spirit, this bride in black that can attach itself to you and follow you and not be present or not make itself known for decades. And at the end, it's going to wait till its moment and it's going to get you. And I, I, I love those ideas. I think we had talked about, I really love the concept of that you can't escape something. We had that in in the grudge um, where you step foot in the house and it's going to get you. But that's soon, right? That's 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 short term stuff. What I like about Insidious is that it latched on to him and it stayed with him um, and uh, it, until it found its, its opportunity. So I think that's what's great about this movie. Um, I could dedicate a whole episode to it. So I'll stop here. I think and, you should uh, check. I think you would actually <laughs> like this one, Brian. It's got some good. It's got some good creepy scares in it. All right, I, I might need to cave. Maybe we can. Uh, maybe we can do like a follow up, and it'll be like Jonathan, the person who loves it, and Brian, the person who, for whatever reason, put it off for nigh on a decade. We should probably <laughs> do that for the whole. Once we get through all the twenty tens or twenty teens, we should do that. We should follow up on some of them and be like, "Hey, yes. well, we watched this one, and we hadn't seen it, so we'll, we'll, we'll we have to collect those." Um, we'll, we'll, we'll make an episode of it. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's jump in. Let's see, see what else we got from uh, 2011 that we want to talk about. I'm going to mix up the order a little bit. So Brian, I'm going to kick it back to you. What do you got? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah, Brian. What do you got? <laughs> uh, can I change mine? I feel like after all the ones I said, I didn't see the one that I want to talk about. No, is no. Just like, this no. Is you my, you my own this, episode. Brian. You own this. <laughs> all right. I'm going to do it. All right. So I would like to preempt this by saying that my discussing it is not an endorsement of it. No, this is just discussing 2011. Sure. I, I think it could make for an interesting chat. So, it's a closet favorite movie of yours. We all know it. I want to talk about none other than Hellraiser Revelations. Um, as we all know, I am very much someone who, like, I, I seem to be the, the guy who likes to collect the island of lost toys, like the misfit movies. Uh, we all know my love for, um, you know, Friday the 13th, Seven, the New Blood. Um, I'm also a big Hellraiser Bloodline fan. Um, I kind of like those ones. I'm even a fan of the Mangler. Um, so those ones that kind of get a bad rap, I usually like to give somewhat of a chance. And I remember seeing Hellraiser Revelations um, shortly after it came out on video, I am a huge Hellraiser fan. Hellraiser is my favorite movie of all time. So I knew it was going to be bad. And I also knew that what the previous five movies that came out before it were bad. So I watched it. I remember at the time, like really not thinking like it was any worse than any of the other ones that had come out recently. And so I came into this with the intention of, you know, kind of easing back a little bit of the hate for it. And I realized as I was going through the Wikipedia entry about all the background for it, about the plot, I think especially when I read through the plot, um, guys, this is really a terrible movie. It's so bad. It's just not good. Um, it is, uh, like I, I get a lot of the anger for it was that they basically just made it to keep from losing the rights and that they couldn't get Doug Bradley back for it. But I think what's like the, the key thing about this is that by trying to write something that was back actually in the Hellraiser kind of sphere, rather than taking a property and wedging Hellraiser into it, they created something that was like the shell of a Hellraiser movie, but showed why Clive Barker is a genius and that you can't duplicate that. Um, you know, none of the characters, while in the original Hellraiser, the characters aren't what you would call likable. They're all compelling. Everybody in this movie is just really just not fun to watch um and obviously the guy playing I, I believe the the term people had for it was fat pinhead um you know I, I don't think he was really fat he probably just wasn't quite as skinny as doug bradley and the makeup made him look a little bit bigger but um i don't know like other than the obvious the fact that this movie probably shouldn't exist in the first place where do you all think it went so very wrong well I now it's my turn to 
to say that I have not seen this one. So I, now I feel like I need to though, because I, <laughs> like, no, you don't. I need to no, see that, what happens. That's, that's debatable. But, the but this is the first. Is that, like you, you have chosen <laughs> to not see a movie that you are better off for not having seen. <laughs> but the, I mean, just looking at it on paper, this is the first one without Doug Bradley, I believe. So, I mean, that's a tough act to follow for, for Stephen Smith Collins as pinhead. I mean, for just that alone had to have put the movie back like 10 paces with people knowing, Oh, it's the first one. No, Doug Bradley is pinhead unless I'm completely missing something, but that's, that's a tough act to follow. Scott, have you seen it? Oh yeah. I've, I've seen it. Derek, yeah. have you seen judgment? Uh, the, the last no, one I have not seen judgment. Oh, and I was going to say, it's it's a little bit worse than Judgment. It's not quite as good as Judgment. Oh, okay. On the Hellraiser scale. <laughs> on yes, the Hellraiser, on the Hellraiser sequel. scale. <laughs> yeah. As but, I say, like aside from like, I think Hellraiser fans have had it maybe the worst. Feel free, franchise fans, to to tell me it one that started out as good and got so bad. I mean, Alien fans have had it pretty bad. But I think Hellraiser fans have had it worse. What I remember from Revelations is that I remember it was I think it was more Hellraiser-y but I, I like what you said about it kind of being the shell of a Hellraiser movie but I feel like it was more Hellraiser-y than some of the sequels before where they had scripts that had been submitted to Dimension and they were like how do you weave Pinhead into this movie for 10 minutes I think like Hell World. If I'm not mistaken, I like is, Hell World. <laughs> I think that's more of an example of where they kind of just they just said, "Well, let's take this movie and let's just add some Pinhead." Well, they um, so all think, were after they yeah. all were after number four. After they were, but one. I but actually, I think Revelations was because of uh, because of the concept or because of where they go. Yeah. I think that was actually one of the more intentionally Hellraiser movies. Um, I still didn't like it, um, but uh, <laughs> but that's what I remember about it. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure this one was written originally as a Hellraiser movie. Um, and I think that was the maybe the credit I first gave it when I saw it, the fact that, you know, at least they were trying to make a Hellraiser movie. Um, but now <laughs> it's just maybe you shouldn't have done that. And it was six years after the previous Hell, Hellraiser Hell World. So that's another little gap for for the franchise yeah um, i know hell world, world is pretty bad but i i still like it for some reason it's just goofy yeah I, it's one of those like <laughs> most of the hellraiser sequels were one and done for me i watched and we were talking a little bit about this last time or, or a couple episodes ago i'll stop at four and i've watched one through four multiple times but i haven't seen in maybe i saw inferno twice but the rest of them i've seen say more than once that's the Scott Derrickson one is Inferno. So yeah, I yeah. like Inferno too. Actually, I like Inferno. Yeah, but I again, being okay it's, with it's that. a wedge. It's one of you use the word weave, which I think is maybe you're being generous, and that's perhaps a little too elegant for <laughs> what they did to these movies. <laughs> weave would imply some kind of you know uh, tapestry cohesion. And, and some talent cohesion, <laughs> and no, they were very much you know the square peg going in the round hole kind of thing but i think inferno is decent the only one i there's the two in the middle there that i haven't seen debtor and hell seeker yeah and hell seeker i haven't seen those two so hell yeah seen. <laughs> one of them's got a cult <laughs> i don't remember i don't remember the other one that was a uh, hell seeker so yeah let, let's see if I can rattle this off. So Inferno is the crooked cop that realizes he's in hell. Sorry, yeah, yes. spoilers. Um, that I think <laughs> was Debtor, which was the one where Kirsty Cotton comes back for like five minutes. Yes. Um, then there's Hellseeker, which that's the cult. Then Hell World, then Revelations, and then the latest was Judgment. And there we go. I, uh, I have probably pushed out some very important information from my brain to know <laughs> that. Just switch debtor and Hellseeker and you got an A. <laughs> Here's my question, though. How many times have you seen movie four and beyond? Like, have you watched them all like more than once or twice? Oh, hell no. Um, OK, except for four bloodline okay. is bloodline is. Four. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Five, yeah. five and beyond. Yeah. Bloodline. Yeah, no, I have I not like seen anything past bloodline more than once. Yeah, okay. I've seen I've seen Inferno twice. Yeah. And okay. I actually I flat out refuse to watch Judgment just 
everything about that just did not look like it was going to make me happy. So I decided <laughs> to just sidestep it's, that one. It's Interesting. slightly, it's slightly better. So than Rebel. Ju- judgment's an interesting one for me because it feels like a sci-fi, like the channel sci-fi pilot for a, a Hellraiser TV series. Like it definitely ends. It, it has that production quality. Like it was because they film a lot of their shows in Vancouver and it has a production quality of some of those, like some of those sci-fi or CW type shows. And it has a more like, it ends on where you can go like in a more episodic format. So it was strange. It felt like a TV show. Um, I don't know if it's a, it's, it's not a compliment. It just kind of <laughs> <No>. is. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it felt like a Hellraiser TV show that, that we didn't really, we didn't really need. But then, you know, it's always one of those things where like, I know how much hard work in some cases went into this stuff. In some cases, if it is a studio that is 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 pushing things through, and that did happen with Dimension, right? But you know, you have uh, like w- w- with Inferno and Scott Derrickson, it's like he has this opportunity to take his story and actually turn it into a movie. How do you fit Hellraiser in? And then you know, w- with uh, with Judgment, it's like like they tried their best um, with it, and obviously you're not always going to be successful. But I do appreciate the attempt, uh, at least in that one. Yeah, no, it does. It does. To be fair to to judgment and it is watchable, like to be fair to judgment, there are some interesting ideas at play, like Jonathan says, that could be um, expanded upon. I think it's it's really a case, though, of where they just need to wipe the blackboard completely clean. And that's what they're going to do. Yeah. Right. And uh, and and get back to square one. and, And hey, every other franchise is doing it. And I what think, I, uh, and I think how the Hellraiser uh, franchise is so potentially interesting and started off so interesting that I think they can definitely, if it's done right, it'll get people interested again. It's kind of interesting too that two of the movies we've mentioned are we're going to see a new entry to those franchises with Final Destination and Hellraiser. I know Hellraiser has been a long time coming for people wanting like a more Clive Barker version, but uh, it's, yeah. So it shows uh, there's still some life left in these franchises. What I love is that we could derail our 2011 topic for like 15 minutes to talk about the Hellraiser sequels. (laughs) I love it. You're welcome everybody. Yeah. I love it. Um, (laughs) It's great. Um, (laughs) But we got to move on. So um, where are we? Uh, Derek, do you have a do you have another pick? I do, and this one is near and dear to my heart. I even managed to sneak it into our 100 essential horror movies. Although some people may be surprised, I consider it an essential horror movie, but I love it so much I did it anyway. And that is Grave Encounters by the Vicious Brothers, the found <laughs> footage. Horror I'll just movie. say up front, I'm out on this one too. So. <laughs> well, this one's a little more obscure, so I, it's not quite insidious level when it came to exposure. So it's it's I think this is forgivable. Uh, this movie, when it came out, it, I think it really took advantage of online marketing in a way that we weren't seeing from a lot of horror movies, not to say that horror movies weren't advertising online at the time, but I remember this was, I remember this had that trailer that was going viral, like on Facebook, everyone seemed to be sharing it in certain horror circles. And it, it just seemed to get like this online viral buzz that maybe wasn't happening a lot. Like in 2011, we were still like YouTube had been around for a few years, but it was still kind of blowing up and Facebook looked very different then than it did now. And so the online world was, was quite a different place. And I feel like Grave Encounters kind of used that to get a foothold into people's eyeballs a little bit. And I remember in, in the trailer, there was this girl and, you know, your classic like haunted asylum set up there in this asylum there, this ghost uh, adventures type team is spending the night in this asylum. They know it's haunted. They want to see if it's for real. But the the twist is like this group is they're kind of aware that they're frauds in a way like the they want to like spice things up and set things up a little bit and then of course they find out things are really haunted and then things take a a very bad turn for them but the they had a girl like in the corner and she turned her head and her mouth 
she screamed and her mouth became like this massive hole. And it was such like a freaky moment. I remember that just really immediately grabbed me and I'm like, I need to see what happens in this movie. And, uh, I love the movie the first time uh, I watched it when it came out, I think it was on VOD and it didn't really get like a huge theatrical release or anything like that. But re- recently rewatching it uh, for our annual Halloween movie marathon, it, it really holds up well. And it's so much fun to watch with a group of friends because it's, it's like a great crowd movie. Um, it's, there's, it's very visceral with its scares, but it's also really psychological, uh, with its horror. There's some moments in it that really mess with your head and it's not just jump scares after jump scare. There's a really disturbing psychological element that's going on in this asylum. And I feel like the vicious brothers kind of you took the found footage genre to a different level with this movie. I think it got overlooked because people were burnt, starting to get burnt out on like the paranormal activity buzz, you know, cause that got its theatrical release in 2009. So everyone is getting hit over the head with found footage again. And I think people were quick to write things off and, and they're like, well, why does it have to be found footage? But I think this story really is enhanced by that medium and it really is a, a fun movie and has a couple of moments that are just really fun to look around at people you're watching with and see how they react because it, uh, it, it goes in some directions you don't expect. So I kind of say it's like Blair Witch Project on steroids. And I, I love, I think Blair Witch Project is still the creepier movie. I, I love that movie to death, but, uh, Grave Encounters is right up there with me, uh, as far as some of the bigger and, and overlooked, uh, found footage movies. It's a spook show kind of movie, Brian. Like if 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 you do dig, uh, you know, found footage, this does have some really great uh, found footage scares. These vicious brothers, they when it comes to that kind of stuff, they they uh, know what they're doing. I'm not sure if I'm completely 100 percent on board with Derek about the the other stuff the psychological that really didn't stick with me so much but as far as for me as far as like scares go it it did impress me there's some there's some good creepy stuff in there i'm uh, i'm happy that i kind of get to be the conduit for the the audience where like by convincing me that i should see all the movies that I probably should have seen going into this episode. Uh, it gives you a chance to, to talk about it. So you're all, you're all welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Scott, now it's on to you. All right. My second pick is going to be, I mean, you got to have a little bit of cage rage in there. So I'm going to go with drive angry, which is list. Brian, have you seen drive angry? Perfect. <laughs> no. <laughs> I love it. This is so great. <laughs> I love it. You know, it's uh, listed as an action adventure movie, but, you know, it really is a horror movie. It's the story itself is, you know, about a guy who races out of hell to try to save his uh, granddaughter's soul, essentially, because his daughter has been kidnapped by a satanic cult. So it's got a bit of that, you know, race with the devil, mid-70s kind of flavor to it, um, upgraded for the modern day. Uh, It's got cool car chases. It's got uh, lots of good gore. Um, You know, the script by Todd Farmer is uh, fun and funny, and it has an incredible performance by uh, not only Nicolas Cage, who's, you know, great, and Amber Heard is great, but William uh, Fitchner as the accountant. I think he's called the accountant. Yes. Yeah. He and he's the one who uh, comes back up to Earth to reclaim Nicolas Cage. Uh, even while Nicolas Cage is out trying to uh, save his granddaughter. It's he fant- was actually, uh, William Fickner was supposed to be like the new Hellraiser in their pitch for Hellraiser to the Weinsteins. Wow. Yeah. That would have been good. That would have been good for sure. Um, yeah, it's, and it was, uh, saw this in the theater. It was in 3D. Um, you know, uh, Patrick, it was, uh, how do you pronounce his name? Patrick uh, Lussier. 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 Jesus, you think that they speak French I mean, in this country? I, I, I might be wrong. So, yeah, I might. Uh, no, let's might go have with it Patrick right. Lussier. No, let's go with Patrick Lussier. Uh, you know, it was the second collaboration with Todd Farmer. They had done uh, My Bloody Valentine uh, before that, just the year before, I think. 
and uh, 2009. Uh, okay, so two years before, and they're a great collaborating team. Uh, seeing it in 3D was a ton of fun, but it's just a great. Like I said, it, it brings to mind um, stuff like Race with the Devil, which is you know mixing you know car chases with the satanic element. It's just drive in gold, and uh, yeah, that's one I. I uh, for those who haven't seen it, um, I think you'll have a really good time, Brian. Yeah, and this is before the cage assance that we've gotten recently. I mean, Cage Nick Cage seems to be in demand again now. Uh, he's got some exciting projects on the horizon. He did Mandy. But this was back when he kind of was, seemed like he was the butt of a lot of jokes uh, with people just, you know, he was doing everything for a paycheck or he was doing like 12 movies a year and not to say that he wasn't working a lot, but it was fun to see him in a role like this. And you're like, Oh wow. So he's really, he's really willing to go all in on something that might be a little more exploitation or that kind of fun throwback seventies grindhouse vibe. And it kind of opened my eyes cause I didn't really no cage as that type of actor yet. Like I grew up with cage doing the national treasure movies and the rock and he was, and those movies are really fun. And, uh, and, and face off of course, and stuff like that. But it didn't like, I guess as a kid, it just seemed like, well, he's the guy that everyone wants in his movies. And then when this came out, it almost seemed like he was a little bit of an underdog or was starting to go away for a little bit, like out of the mainstream eye. So it was really cool to see him get a chance to kick some ass in this movie. And there's so many great character actors in this. Uh, it, w- it was fun to see Tom Atkins again. I know he was also in My Bloody Valentine 2009. Uh, so they Farmer and Lessier were keeping the Tom Torch lit for all of us uh, because we weren't seeing Tom Atkins and a lot of stuff in that time period. Uh, so it was really fun to see that. And Amber Heard, uh, who you may have heard uh, Patrick and Heather uh, talk about Amber on the recent Stepfather episode of Corpse Club. Uh, this was a couple of years after that. So she was staying in the horror space uh, for a little while. Uh, Billy Burke, who went on to do Revolution on NBC. I was a huge fan of that show. So there's and David Morsey. I mean, the list goes on. There's a really fun cast for this movie. And it. I, I remember uh, the, seeing this trailer like a hundred times in theaters and it was the funnest trailer ever. I mean, I just loved watching the like the one liners that William had and the grindhouse style of it. It felt like the third movie of the planet terror, um, the planet terror, uh, death proof double feature that we saw a few years earlier. So that was a lot of fun as a viewer. Can I just say that I love that over all the Corpse Club episodes we've done, I've never heard you refer to anyone by just their last name, but that you just call him cage. I love it. <laughs> I mean, really, does he, re- he doesn't even require that first name. It's no, like he, he doesn't. Yeah. It's just yeah, There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And, you know, and I have fond memories of, of seeing this movie in the theater. It's one of those for me, one and done. I have a lot of those where it's like I had a good time. It was great. It was kind of like going to a concert or amusement park. It was fun. Um, but now it kind of makes me want to see this again. So um, hopefully uh, Amazon Prime or Shudder or Netflix or something. I'll uh, I'll give it another try. So, um, I guess it's back to me. Um, and, and one of the interesting things too is when, and I've loved talking with, with all of you here about these movies and, uh, hopefully our readers have, or our listeners have enjoyed listening to it. Uh, but we still have movies or we still have TV and games to talk about. So I'm gonna get through this one quick. Now, you know, some people, they may, you know, you know, pick movies, uh, that are firmly in 2011, But I'm going to cheat here a little bit, and I'm going to pick a movie that dips into 2011 and a little bit into 2012. I know we haven't done that earlier, but uh, but I'm going to to break the rules and I'm going to pick a movie that uh, came out in uh, the UK in September 2nd of 2011. And that is Ben Wheatley's Kill List. Um, This is one of my favorite 2010s movies, and I don't think people see it enough and I won't cheat and double dip. So I'll leave this out of 2012. I may mention it, but I'm not going to, it won't be an official pick, but Kill List is a, is a great movie. Um, and especially with, 
people revisiting folk horror or pagan horror. We got Midsummer coming out. People are talking about like the Wicker Man vibe that 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 seems to have. I'm excited to see that one. Um, Kill List is definitely in a similar vein, and I think also what it does is it has a, a very big tonal shift where it you know almost like uh, like from dusk till dawn where it's one movie and then it becomes another and i don't really want to give anything away even though it's uh you know it's it's been uh eight years i I just think a lot of people haven't seen it so i try to turn on uh people to it as much as i can brian we'll start with you have you seen this one I'm just going to go walk into the ocean now. Like, I don't know why, I don't know why I'm hosting a horror podcast. I clearly haven't seen any horror movies. I think I'm just going to, I'm going to call it a, call it a career. Uh, I think two episodes is a good run. So, uh, thanks guys. It, it's been fun. Shows uh, canceled before their time. <laughs> I'll only tease you a little bit. Um, Scott, have you seen this one? Yes. I really enjoy, uh, uh, kill list. I think this and, um, completely different but um oh gosh uh free fire are are my two favorite uh ben wheatley movies uh kill list is just yeah it reminds it ends it starts off as one thing and then like you said it has uh a tonal shift even though there is a sense of dread that permeates the front half of the movie where you sense something is going, uh, something seems askew, something seems off and you get vibes that bad things are going to happen. And some bad things do happen. Um, I mean, he does play an assassin. So, but where it ends up going, and again, I won't get spoilery because there are people who haven't seen it and, I don't want to spoil anything for them, but it ends up in places that you do not see coming, but that make total sense in retrospect. So it's one of those uh, movies where it it pulls the rug out from underneath you. And uh, yeah, it's so, so good. And fun to rewatch. So it's like after you know what's going on and right. you're, just, you're rewatching it, it's it's one of those movies that's really great to see over again or to uh, to to watch with someone when it's their first time. Derek, have you seen this one? Yeah, actually, funnily enough, this movie was one that you strongly recommended to me after I joined the Daily Dead team oh, back in I remember 2014. <laughs> yeah, I remember we were talking about horror movies and I think A Field in England was just coming out or had just come out. And so we were talking about Ben Wheatley. I hadn't seen any of his movies and you just were like, you have to see Kill List. So I remember literally just sitting down one afternoon and renting it on like through Amazon and watching it and just sitting there waiting for you to call again so that I could tell you I'd seen kill list. (laughs) Like I'd done my homework for the day and, uh, it, yeah, it did not disappoint. Like it was really unlike anything I had seen, especially in the way it, yeah, it turns it, you think it's one thing and then it turns into something else and boy, does it really go there too. Uh, and it's approach to violence was really interesting. I just hadn't seen a lot of British horror at the time. So this was kind of a, a gateway movie for that type of subgenre. And yeah, they really, uh, they really went there with it. So, um, yeah, Ben Wheatley and Amy jump who wrote it and have collaborated on, numerous projects since then it's it's kind of fun to go back and and see not where it all started necessarily but definitely one of the earlier films of his and yeah he it really uh, set him apart as far as like wow this guy's somebody to watch yeah yeah and this is i mean this is out from ifc so chances are you can pick it up everywhere just one of those movies that kind of got lost in the shuffle it was like i mean it was it was at the start of that indie horror boom, but also like VOD services weren't the necessarily the main go to and there wasn't a service like Shudder. So I think this would have been a much bigger movie had it come out, you know, now as opposed to eight years ago. Um, but we we made it through our movie segment. Um, I don't know how how much time we spent, but we uh, we spent a lot of time on movies, and, and I was happy to talk about them. But we have other things from 2011 we're gonna gonna jump into. So uh, so stay with us because we're gonna talk about the very relevant um, Hot 100 singles of 2011. Um, come on, you knew this was gonna happen if you uh, if you were here for the 2010. <laughs> so the number one song of 2011 was Adele's "Rolling in the Deep." I've heard that, that one. one. 
Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. We're, we're bringing you back, Brian. Um, uh, the party rock anthem from LMAFO or FAO, excuse me. We have Firework from Katy Perry, ET from Katy Perry. She's on there twice. Um, what else do we have? Moves Like Jagger from Maroon 5. Uh, SNM from Rihanna. Pumped Up Kicks from Foster the People. Well, so we got uh, Just the Way You Are, Bruno Mars. Um, there's there's a lot of songs. You're Born This Way from Lady Gaga. These these were the songs that uh, that the kids were listening to. Mm. And, um, yeah. Get on, you kids. Yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago. It and really uh, some of the m- movies we didn't talk about, because they had nothing to do with horror, so I'm going to run through some of those. Hopefully they're right, and they're not, you know, their premiere date from the year before. Um, we have X-Men First Class, and we have Drive, we have Moneyball, we have uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, which uh, I had a lot of fun with that uh, that reboot. Not as much with Rise, but definitely with the the two after it. Uh, apparently Super 8 came out in 2011. Oh, wow. And like a precursor I, to Stranger Things. Yeah, I haven't seen it since, but you know that's that's why I, I look at some of these and I'm like, oh, like it was it was a while back. And then thinking about some of the movies that we thought would be big or all time classics, like even if you loved Super Eight back then, it just seems like people don't really talk about it that much right now. Um, we also had the uh, the Marvel. Um, the Marvel Universe uh, with two entries, Captain America and Thor first started this year. And we had the girl with the dragon tattoo, which uh, underperformed, sadly. Um, and uh, another Mission Impossible, Ghost Protocol. There were a lot of dude, there were a lot of movies, wow. um, but but we're, we're getting out of movies, right? We were, we were in music. And now I want to spend a little time <laughs> talking about video games. Scott, I know you're you're super excited about this one. But uh, 2011 was also a pretty killer year for uh, for video games. And uh, and Brian, I'm going to let you kind of take it because I know you're you're playing something from 2011 right now. So why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Yes. Uh, very excited to talk about it. So excited to talk about it that I inserted myself to an episode that I had no business being in. But we're here <laughs> now. And so I am currently playing on the Switch. They uh, last year put out Dark Souls Remastered. Uh, this is a video game uh, that started a pretty popular series back in 2011. Uh, I think it started on like PlayStation 3 or something like that. And this this game is very well known for being intentionally obtuse and difficult. Um, if you're looking for a game that's going to give you some kind of a tutorial and lead the way in terms of what you're supposed to do, this is not a game for you. And even if it is something where you know where you're supposed to go, getting there is going to take you a very long time. Um, it's one of those games that's just so intentionally difficult that a lot of people from what I've heard, if, if they didn't know what they were getting into, just were absolutely not into it at all. But fortunately, um, when I started playing it last year, a buddy of mine is very into video games and he was able to put it into the appropriate context where he basically said like, just be willing to die a bunch because you are going to absolutely die a bunch. But if you're willing to stick with it and, you know, just kind of keep playing through and dying and dying and dying, then eventually when you do kind of hit these certain benchmarks, it's going to be absolutely amazing and it's going to be a great experience. And so um, this was actually a bit of a, I don't know, a, uh, a test for me because I'm usually very like results and advancing oriented. So I figured this was almost kind of a, a video game meditation for me. Like, can I just enjoy the experience even if I'm not getting to that end goal as quickly as I want to. And boy, do I ever not get to that end goal. I think I've probably put about 85 hours into this game. And from what I can tell, I'm maybe about two thirds of the way into it, but it's also very much kind of my aesthetic. It's very dark fantasy. It's got like medieval, but it's also got magic. It's got monsters. It's got demons and it's just so much fun. And I, I, I do, I I understand what the guy was saying when he said like, there are going to be certain moments where when you kind of reach that pinnacle, it's going to feel amazing. And it absolutely does. I, I really, really love this game. This is like it's learning or rewarding through death. Mm -hmm. Um, There may I mean, maybe uh, I'm thinking it was was a a Ninja Gaiden. Um, 
you know, it was was also a very, very difficult game, uh, if I remember correctly. But Dark Souls is the most punishing game I think I've played as well. Um, it's one of those that if I was one of those people that threw the controller regularly, I'd be throwing it out the window all the time or at the television. Um, it, it was so punishing that I didn't play any of the sequels. But uh, but yeah, this is this is a good one, and um, and what I like is that uh, like you had mentioned, you know, this game came out in 2011, but you're playing it remastered on the Switch now, so there are plenty of ways to kind of play it and uh, and give it a try. It's not too expensive, so uh, I think this is a, this is a good one to uh, to pick up. Uh, Derek, have you played this one? No, I haven't, but I'm intrigued because it sounds kind of like the Summoner or Elder Scrolls, and I've spent a decent amount of time either playing or watching my dad play those video games. So it sounds uh, kind of like it'd be right up my alley because I, I kind of like that mixture of like medieval type sorcery, but with, uh, you know, death and, <laughs> and uh, sword. the sword and sorcery combo is, is very appealing to me. Yeah, so something especially like with Dark Souls. I mean, they they go really dark with it, so it definitely definitely leans horror. Um, I don't know if you like, guys. Sorry, I was just going to say real yeah. quick uh, because I'm I don't know a lot about uh, video games. It's been a few years since I played, but I don't know if you guys remember, but they made a video game out of uh, uh, Rawhead Rex, except they changed the name to Crash Bandicoot. Uh. <laughs> I used to play that game all the time. That is one of my all-time favorites. Uh, the first three Crash Bandicoots and Crash Team Racing on PlayStation 1 were my childhood. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know the Rawhead Rex connection, though. I'll well, it do... strays. It does stray from the source material. Uh, does Barker get royalties for that? Or... <laughs> well, that's why they changed the name. Okay. I mean, the story's the mm. same, essentially. Um, so they, you know. they uh, vanilla iced Rawhead Rex and made it just different oh. enough. Exactly. Okay. Precisely. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> and that's my two cents on on uh, horror video games. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was interesting, Derek, that you brought up uh, Elder Scroll because Skyrim came out in 2011. Um, it may seem like Skyrim just keeps coming out over and over and over and over and over and over again on different platforms and formats and getting remastered and getting VR versions. Um, but uh, it speaks to the... Um, I guess the tremendous accomplishment that was this game, that it continues to live uh, on and on, and people continue to have fun with it. Um, let's see what other games came out. Uh, Arkham City. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that because we're a horror podcast. But Arkham City was fun. That is a um, yeah. That's a dark game. I think I, yeah. I, there is there's some darkness there. I think, yeah, because was that before or after Arkham Asylum? Was that uh, no, it was a sequel. It's okay. when they expanded it. So they have, you know, Batman can kind of like glide around the entire city. Because those those Batman stories are more like Scarecrow Nightmares uh, level insanity. So I think I think anything with Arkham in the title is pretty damn scary. <laughs> yeah, there's okay. definitely yeah, well, a touch of horror in um, I, I haven't played City, but I played uh, Asylum. And uh, those uh, the, oh. the Scarecrow scenes were, yeah, they're they're horror through and through. And they're yeah. trippy too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, they're good stuff. And hopefully, I think we're getting a new one. So it's there were rumors that we're getting a new one. Um, and then there's there's Dead Space Two, which is it, Dead Space is such a great series, and it's one of those that I hope uh, gets remastered editions. And maybe there are. I haven't been keeping up with it. But if you haven't played it, play Dead Space. Play Dead Space Two. Um, if De Dead Space is kind of like a Alien Event Horizon type thing with the, with mixed with the thing, um, and um, if that was Alien, Dead Space Two is Aliens. They took what worked mm. in the first one, and they added a lot of action. But then they also have tons of scares. They gave you more weapons. They gave you more ammo. They have these incredible like action moments. But then they have these incredibly tense and terrifying um, scenes. And and you know they were they were working. It may, how do you make a game like this more accessible? You were talking, Brian, about Dark Souls and how it's so punishing that most people don't finish it. They buy it and they don't finish it. And so, you know, the, the developers were like, well, we had people playing Dead Space and they get so scared that they don't finish. They don't go more than, you know, the we'll say like the, you know a tenth of it. I don't remember what it was, but uh, but I do remember that a very high percentage, like a majority percentage, never finished the game, never got through half of it. They were like, uh-uh, this isn't for me. I paid $60 for it or $50 or whatever, and I'm done. Um, but I do think that Dead Space improves upon that because you can only be tense so much. I think that a game like Resident Evil 7, which only was like eight hours, is like the right amount of intensity. And it, it felt like 
Dead Space is a little bit longer. And so I think when they break it up with these action moments, it's great. I think Dead Space is an all-time great uh, horror survival uh, video game. And it uh, kind of makes me sad that we, we don't that, that, that developers essentially um, done with the series. Um, and uh, we had Dead Space 3. It didn't do well. Um, unfortunately, you know, EA tries to push for maximum profitability. And it was like, how do we put microtransactions in this? How do we go co-op? How do we make it even more accessible and remove more horror? And that backed, uh, or that um, that uh, backfired on them. And then also they were like, well, how do we move it into other uh, types of games? And there was like a flight simulator in Dead Space that they spent money on for R and D. And all this money kind of chipped away at the budget, which they could have just put on a proper sequel. Um, I'm hoping that with horror survival horror coming back in a big way, they invest a little bit into Dead Space. Um, I know it's a movie or uh, something that also John Carpenter had talked about because he's a huge video gamer um, and uh, had talked about you know being interested in getting involved with it in some way shape and form because like i said they take a lot from the thing um has anybody uh here here played it you know i bought the first dead space and i never i think i played the like a little bit of it i never got fully into it i think i i think i bought it with like three other games and it just sat in a pile so i still have it to this day on like the playstation three or probably playstation three Maybe four, and uh, well, if it's the first one, definitely three. Um, but I never did get the sequel. But I, I was always intrigued by like the horror sci-fi setup of it because I'm like, oh, that sounds like a really cool combination. And the Event Horizon comparison was a, kind of an immediate hook. Uh, but yes, sadly, I've not played it. So maybe I should just do that and go play it after this episode. Just do it. I don't know. I have the, the sad Ben Affleck face. No, as it zooms in on you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a very, like a huge backlog of horror video games from like the last 10 years to play because, uh, you know, I've played a lot of like Call of Duty and that kind of stuff or like Call of Duty Zombies a little bit. But um, my my horror video gaming has unfortunately stalled out a little bit. So I need to uh, kick the engine and get back into it because there's just as many movies that we have lately. Like we're in a golden age of, of horror video games or we're starting to kind of open that up again. Yeah. Uh, 2011 also saw uh, Dead Island, which was like there was huge buzz around that. I don't know if if you guys remember, but from the uh, there was that cinematic trailer that really was was very emotional and was like showing like a a zombie Mm. apocalypse affects this this family. And people are like, wow, wow, this is going to be a heavy hitting, like really story driven game. And then we played the game and uh, the game was nothing like that. Like it, it's, it's interesting because like, like good on them for investing the time and having this concept for a trailer that this trailer was not really representative of the game at all, but it sold it. Right. So some mission accomplished on their part. Um, that said, the game is fun. The game, um, you know, you're on the island. It's kind of a standard shooter with weak RPG elements. We can pick different characters. You have different abilities. And you're in this, you know, you're on an island. It's sunny. It's, you know, a different setting. And you have, it focuses a lot on melee. So it's a lot about what can you hit the zombies with, not what can you shoot them with. That's very different from your, your standard shooters where it's mostly guns. Um, so there were some good things about this. Um and uh, and I do remember enjoying playing it. I know they were there was talk about you know a Dead Island two, and they kind of did like a multiplayer online, um, like battle arena style game, but just really never never took off. And and, and I understand why. But uh, but this game was huge, and the buzz around this was huge in 2011. It was like it was one of the biggest uh, like pop culture things. Um, yeah, in terms of video gaming. I remember that trailer, and I, that was right when The Walking Dead was really starting to take off, and I. Yeah, I do remember thinking, wow, that looks like a really intense, gritty uh, zombie game. And then, like you said, the the gameplay itself is completely different. I, I did play the uh, the online battle game, I think, where you're you kind of team up with other players and and run around on the island. And so I did I played that for a while, but never really got into like the campaign of the original uh, Dead Island. But I do remember that commercial being like really intense because The Walking Dead had only been on for it was only in its second season at that time. So like zombie violence was not people weren't quite used to like zombie situations on like mainstream television yet. So it was still kind of shocking. So I remember uh, just if people were in the room and that was on, it was kind of like, whoa, what's going on here? (laughs) 
Yeah, and um, yeah, I mean, like I said, just zombie mania was like at an all time high here. So um, yeah, like I said, definitely definitely a memorable experience. Even though I think the game wasn't what we would have liked. That said, uh, Techland did create uh, Dying Light, and they're doing Dying mm. Light too. So if you enjoyed um, Dead Island, and you're like, hey, I wish I could have seen more from those guys. I mean, they are making zombie games now, um, and uh, it's a, it's a little bit different, a little more uh, story driven, a little more focused, a lot more parkour. Um, if you're looking for that in your game, what about Plankton? And, you know what? We, well, I have to check. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully they're they're keeping the plank alive. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'm not positive. And so I think that'll bring us through uh, through to video games. And we're still going. We are still going, guys. We are almost at the end of 2011. Um, I promise you, Scott and, and Brian and Derek, <laughs> we will get through this. Um, but there's so much. Uh, it's so much content. Like we won't be able to do this for the, for 2020s it'll be like all the things that came out and it'll be like well there were a hundred horror movies from different streaming services like we won't be able to do it um but 2011 was interesting i'm going to do some call outs if you guys want to talk about any feel free but game of thrones started in 2011 uh on the horror side the first season of american horror story was in 2011 Ooh, wow. that was a good season murder House. many would say the best season yeah you know what i like coven better I bought. I, I, I bought into Coven one hundred and fifty percent, but the the uh, uh, but Murder House is is yeah, it's the second best for me. And Emma Roberts was coming off of uh, Scream Four around the time Coven came out, so yeah, it's all connected. But yeah, I um, uh, I really like Coven. I mean, we're not talking too much about American Horror Story, but I think it's interesting that when you talk to someone who's watched it, like everybody's like favorites or ranks are different. And also there's always seems to be like different times where people checked out. They're like, oh, like I, I left after Coven or like Roanoke is what did it. And like, I haven't been back <laughs> since. Um, but mm. uh, yeah, it's, it's something different for everybody. A, a common denominator though with that, it seems like Murder House is usually either number one for people or in the top two. And I'm wondering, do you think that's because Murder House was the first one that everyone remembers or was it like a quality thing too, where the story was just better than most things that came out? I think it was just better done. Um, I actually, actually really like uh, season two as well. Asylum. Oh, Asylum. Yeah. So I liked the first three seasons uh, quite a bit. They lost me with the, uh, with the Moulin Rouge uh, tribute in season four with the singing and, and, uh, and the clowns and that. And yeah, and I've Twisty. kind of been, <laughs> yeah, I've kind of been on and off um, ever since, but I just think that first one was, the tone of it, we hadn't quite seen that in a while. Um, and it was just really well performed. And I think Ryan Murphy's voice sounded fresher in that first season. And as the series wore on, I think that very particular uh, tone that that he produces, I think, uh, uh, just for myself anyway, I guess, um, just kind of got tiresome. Fair enough. Yeah. And, and Ryan and Ryan has so much on his plate now, too, where you think about it, he's got it seems like he always has three or four different shows going. And this kind of I know he had done Glee and some other stuff before. But this that first season of American Horror Story, I think, really got him like opened a lot of doors for him even more. And uh, yeah, maybe it was the freshness of it, too. It's 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 always interesting because it seems like anyone I talk to Murder House is is right up there. Yeah, we had a, we had a lot of horror TV running as I'm looking at it right now. So we had The Walking Dead season two, which is kind of a make or break season Ooh. for that show, because obviously season two, Frank Darabont was was out uh, very early in the making of the, the season. And Frank uh, or uh, Glenn Mazzara was in. So uh, that like I said, that was really a make or break season. And, and they had to, they had to shift it. They had to, you know, I think season three was almost kind of a quasi reboot, but uh, it was definitely maybe the first moment during The Walking Dead where everybody who was like, oh, well, like, should I really keep watching? And so we kind of lost people and then you gain new people in season three and then lose people and it's up and down. Um, but this was kind of the uh, the first uh, first hiccup um, yeah, along the way. How many showrunners have they been through now? Um, they're at four because they had uh, they had Frank Darabont, Glenn Mazzara, um, Scott Gimple and Angela Kang's a new one. OK. 
Um, and we had other shows that were still running. Uh, Supernatural was running strong. Um, this was an interesting year because they had finished with Kripke on the... Uh, I used the last name, Derek. They finished with Kripke on the uh, <laughs> last... Uh, he's cage uh, the, status for you. Yeah, he's cage status for me. I love those first five seasons. And then we moved into season six. Um, and we like so we had Game of Thrones running. We had True Blood, which was uh, starting to uh, to decline. I think that was like... That was one of those shows. And there, you know, there are numerous examples. But that was a show where like the quality of that show in the first like couple seasons was like really high. And then then things started to shift. And I think this was around when it started to happen. Uh, the Vampire Diaries was still running. Grimm started on NBC. Um, and that one ran for a while. That ran for six years. Have you guys seen Grimm? Oh, man. Wow. Grimm, that was the the dumbest show that I couldn't help but keep watching. I love the that formula part. worked. <laughs> yeah, it, that was uh, I, I don't remember when I tuned out, but I remember Christy and I watched at least a couple of seasons of it. Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't think I quite made it to the end of that run, but I got pretty deep into it. And my wife, that was one my wife and I both watched. And like every time afterwards, it was like, man, that was kind of stupid. Let's check out next <laughs> episode just to see what happens. And we did that for like <laughs> three or four years. <laughs> That's funny. We had a lot of shows. So Teen Wolf just started in 2011. We had Lost Girl that was running in 2011. The U.S. version of Being Human was running. Fringe was still going strong. Like there's, there was a lot of genre TV. Yeah. So yeah. it was, and a lot of it too was still on cable. It was, you know, we Netflix was, I think, mostly known as a mail-in service for a lot of people at that time and you know like hulu and shutter and all these other things they either weren't around or they were some of them were years uh, away from even existing but even ones that did exist were in the infant stages and i think a lot of our tv viewing was still relegated to weekly episodes on whatever you had like maybe you had uh, paid subscriptions to hbo and showtime so you had a little more options that way but it was very much uh, like to a 1990s, 2000s template for entertainment. And then we were little did we know that we were about to get like a thousand different more options, depending on how much we wanted to pay for it. But uh, it's pretty amazing because I remember having Netflix at that time and just being amazed at how many movies I had access to um, if, if I could uh, wait to receive them in the mail. And I thought that was amazing on its own. And little did I know, like that was about to change f <laughs> like drastically. So it's, it's kind of am amazing looking back at that year in television. Derek, I completely forgot that Netflix started out as a DVD <laughs> service. <laughs> <laughs> and still is and it still, still is, is but like but in, um like talking I, about true blood that was how i got to see true blood we we kept having to get like one dvd at a time got to see a few episodes had to send it back and you know kind of plowed through that way like binging wasn't it, really possible at that point it, it doesn't seem like that long ago, but it just goes to show like how much has changed in, in such little time when it comes to how we consume entertainment and how much entertainment is available at our fingertips these days. Yeah, so it's, and, uh, it's pretty crazy. And there were uh, I want to give a shout out to a few books that came out that year, believe it or not, because uh, <laughs> I think it's kind of interesting. A uh, few few notable ones. You mentioned Game of Thrones and 2011 was when a dance with dragons came out. That was the. The most recent one, and a lot of people are still waiting for that next one. In still that waiting. <laughs> uh, the most recent one was in 2011. <laughs> not to uh, to rub salt in the wound for anyone who's been waiting patiently or impatiently for that. Uh, the Ritual by Adam Neville came out that year, and we saw a movie adaptation of that um, last year. It came out on Netflix. I think. People saw it at festivals in 2017. Um, a Discovery of Witches, uh, the book was released, and now that's a series on Shudder and uh, AM, the AMC streaming service. Uh, the final book in the Strain trilogy from Guillermo del Toro and Chuck Hogan, uh, The Night Eternal, was released. And, of course, uh, it would be a, just a couple more years and we'd see the Strain TV series. And uh, Stephen King had... His uh, book release that year was 112263, the time traveling uh, novel about the guy who goes back in time uh, to stop the JFK assassination. So there was, and so all of those have been adapted, uh, the ones I just mentioned, in one form or another 
Uh, so it wasn't quite uh, like a huge year for books necessarily, uh, at least on like a massive horror scale. But uh, a lot of stuff that came out that year was uh, adapted in just a few years after the book was released. So that's kind of interesting. That's crazy. I remember for eleven twenty two sixty three. that was, I mean, it was eight years ago. I met Stephen King on his book tour for that. Like, that was a, a really big moment for me. I was able to uh, talk to him a little bit, get my book signed, and listen to him talk about how much he uh, hated the uh, the movie version of The Shining. But uh, it didn't <laughs> seem like that long ago. <laughs> he was still talking about it, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah, still does. Wow. Did, did uh, he talk to you about the... Uh, TV version of it at all or yeah I mean that was he, he did mention it I mean, definitely closer to, to what he wanted he, he I think I've talked about this before um, but he, he just didn't like the fact that there he didn't see any arc you know in, in, in Jack Nicholson he was kind of bad to begin with he stays bad and Stephen King you know always he always pictured like somebody like John Voight because I mean a lot of them are like reflections of himself so he w- likes to see these redemptive characters um, and we really didn't have that for uh, for Jack Nicholson in The Shining. Do you think he pictured someone like James Marsden? Because I believe that's who they're going with for a, a, another swing at this. Correct? Oh, that's the uh, the stand. Is oh, uh, they right, want him to right. play Stu Redman, I believe. So, but yeah, it's oh. crazy though, right? Because oh no, uh, Patrick Patrick Wilson is Stu Redman. Oh, you're right, because he could do the Texas the, the kind of the blue collar Texas guy. He's he should be Stu Redman. I don't see James Marsden as as Stu Redman. I see him more as Larry Underwood. Ooh, yeah, I could see that. The rock star. Yeah. Yeah. And anyone else but Rob Lowe as... uh, (laughs) (laughs) What's his name? Nick? Nick. I could actually see Marsden as as Nick. Yeah, you could could do that, that too. Yeah. As long as Rob Lowe is not allowed to play him again. That's all I ask. (laughs) Oh, no, he's going to be Randall Flagg in this one. Uh, yeah, no, that's not bad, actually. <laughs> can, can we, like, isolate the noise that Scott just made? <laughs> yes, of course we can. This can be isolated and turned into a ringtone every time he calls. Uh, <laughs> and I think that is the perfect spot to close out this episode of Corpse Club. Um, thanks to my co-host for taking a look back at 2011. Hope all of our listeners um, enjoyed uh, taking a, uh, a listen back to uh, 2011. And hopefully we gave you some suggestions, whether it's movies, games, books, TV. Um, we're going to keep this going. So we'll have, uh, you know, 2012, 2013. We'll do one a month. Um, it may not be as exciting by the time we get to 2018. or like, hey, that was last year. But <laughs> we'll see where <laughs> it goes. Um, anyway, make sure to visit CorpseClub.com to check out our latest latest episode and our entire backlog you can also sign up to become a member we have different membership tiers allow you to get a corpse club t-shirt a pin a membership card you can select an episode topic for an upcoming episode make sure to rate and review us on itunes uh, every rating and review really helps so uh, please head over to itunes and uh, and give us some reviews you can also find us on google play soundcloud and all of your favorite podcast providers if you want to get in touch you can reach out anytime at contact at corpseclub.com or on twitter we're at daily dead news at corpse club and we're on instagram and facebook under corpse club uh, if we missed something if you have a favorite from 2011 you want to talk about if there's something you want us to talk about for 2012 and beyond uh, Uh, let us know. Um, We also want to thank uh, Brian, our spectacular engineer, for helping us out each and every episode. And uh, thanks for listening. Until next time, stay scary.